much or you need some time to get your dog head done. Well, thank you very much. I am so thrilled by that, and uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to come here and not just to receive that, but to say congratulations to all of you. This is your day, and uh, your parents and family are so proud of you, as you already know. I, I got the enthusiasm and uh, energy with which you stood and thanked them for uh, making all of this uh, possible, but congratulations on what you have accomplished here. And to uh, Dr. Jimmy Cheek, uh, the Chancellor, and, and uh, Dr. Jan Chimek, uh, President, uh, Dr. Susan Martin, uh, the Provost at UT, Dr. Bruce Burston, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and to all of the members of the, uh, the faculty uh, and everyone who uh, has made this great institution what it is, uh, thank you, uh, and thank you for having me here. I do want to acknowledge Dr. Dan Simberloff, the Nancy Gore Hunger Professor of Environmental uh, Science, Ecology, and Evolutionary uh, Biology. You know, um, you've probably um, become well aware of the fact that the University of Tennessee is now recognized in the university community of our country as one of the preeminent leaders uh, in its own environmental standards and the steps that have been taken uh, to provide uh, a demonstration of lower energy and environmental uh, responsibility, and I did want to uh, acknowledge that. I'm going to say a few words to you, but I want you to know that I am quite aware of what my role is here. And I did uh, think back, I, it's not the first commencement speech I've ever made, but the first one, uh, I, I tried to think back to my own commencement, and I tried again before this one. And I remember, the, uh, I remember my family being there, and I remember the weather and the feelings of excitement and relief and uh, the parties. And I have, absolutely, I have absolutely no idea who gave the speech at my <laughs> commencement. None whatsoever. Um, <laughs> I gave a commencement speech one year at uh, MIT, and in doing research for it, I found that in their <coughs> early years, their commencement speaker dropped dead right in the middle of the speech. <laughs> and since it was more than a hundred years ago, uh, I, I figured it was okay to joke about it. <laughs> and I, I told them I was uh, only the second stiffest commencement speaker that they had ever had. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, You've probably heard the old cliche that a commencement is both uh, an end and a beginning, and it is, but that's just another way of saying that it's a transition event. It, it is a way station on the continual transfer of responsibility from one generation to the next. The passing of the diploma that will take place here is, in a sense, the passing uh, of a torch, and it is sometimes seen therefore, as an occasion not only to congratulate you, but to make some kind of assessment of uh, what you're getting into. And those who've come before you have done a pretty good job in so many ways. Our country is the preeminent economic and military and political leader of the world. We've got the best higher education system and the strongest uh, economy. Uh, and we've made great progress against the many challenges uh, that we've had to confront. But uh, there are some unfinished matters on America's uh, agenda. And as you look at the job market out there, uh, I know that some of you are right now trying to make plans uh, for what you're going to do. Uh, I talked to a young graduate last week I said, how do you feel about uh, where you go from here? He said, well, I feel fine about it. And it reminded me uh, of a story I heard from one of Dolly Parton's uh, former colleagues at the Grand Old Opry, Cousin Minnie Pearl from Grinder Switch. And for young people who may not remember her, she was the one with a straw hat that had the price tag on it. 
Her real name was Mrs. Sarah Cannon, and she was a highly educated, refined, wonderful woman, but her character was as country as country could be. And 30-some-odd uh, years ago, uh, Betty Ann Tanner, driving uh, in my old congressional district on a Saturday night, I was listening to the Grand Old Opry, and Cousin Minnie Pearl told a story about a farmer who was involved in an accident and he went to court and sued the other driver for damages. And the lawyer for the other driver put this farmer on the witness stand and cross-examined him and said, now isn't it true that right after the accident you said, I feel fine? And the farmer said, well, it's not that simple. You see, I was driving my cow to town in the back of my truck, and this fellow came driving across the center line, and the lawyer said, wait a minute. We don't want to hear a long, involved story. We're in the middle of a trial here. Answer the question, yes or no. Did you or did you not say, immediately after the accident, I feel fine? And Farmer said, well, now, I was leading up to that. You see, I was taking my cow to town in the back of my truck. And this feller came driving across the center line and ran right smack dab into my truck and knocked it over and threw me out and threw the cow out. I was on one side and the cow was on the other. And the Highway patrolman came up and took one look at that cow and said, mm, she is suffering. Pulled out his gun and shot her right between the eyes. <laughs> came around to my side of the truck and said, how do you feel? <laughs> so, so I said, I feel fine. <laughs> and, uh, so keep in mind that the alternative to not sitting here and getting this diploma <laughs> is not acceptable. And you ought to feel great about it. And the uh, uh, economy is now improving. But you'd be surprised if I didn't make uh, at least brief mention of the one problem that I think is the biggest item of unfinished business on our agenda, and that is uh, the climate crisis. And to put it in uh, perspective, this morning we heard the news that this oil spill down uh, in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, 50 miles off Louisiana, a mile underwater, uh, is gushing oil at a much higher rate than they had originally said, maybe 10 times as much. And according to the estimates this morning, uh, it's spilling out the equivalent of one Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill uh, every four days. Now, they told us it was safe to do that, and without going into the particulars of why they were wrong about that, I want to note the fact that all this oil spilling out into the Gulf of Mexico is causing a lot of damage, but it is far from the only uncontrolled gusher of pollution into the environment. Matter of fact, just 40 miles west of here, I passed by there uh, on, on the way up here yesterday from from uh, Middle Tennessee. You remember that uh, coal ash spill? What it has in common with the spill in the Gulf of Mexico is it's connected to our dependence on carbon-based fuels. Uh, about as far to the northeast as that is to the west, uh, you see evidence of this mountaintop mining practice, which spills all the debris down into the valleys and poisons the, uh, the creeks and a drinking water for many communities. But the biggest uncontrolled gusher of pollution by far is the global warming pollution that we're putting up there uh, all the time at the rate of 90 million tons per day. And they're telling us that's all right too. Each of the average uh, coal-fired generating plants in the United States every day puts three times as much global warming pollution into the atmosphere as that oil spill is putting into the Gulf of Mexico. And there are 1,400 of them in the United States alone. Worldwide, every three or four seconds, we're putting as much global warming pollution into the atmosphere as that uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico is putting into the ocean uh, in a, uh, every, every single day. Uh, and it causes consequences. It's, n it's not controversial that CO2 traps heat. And since we have expanded at the rate of 90 million tons per day, it's trapping a lot more heat. The North Polar ice cap is disappearing. Uh, virtually all of the mountain glaciers uh, in the entire world are in the process uh, of melting, disrupting uh, the hydrological cycle. 
Uh, average humidity has increased 4% already, so we get bigger downpours. And the scientists always say that uh, it's a mistake to say a particular large weather event like the flooding of Nashville two weeks ago uh, is caused by global warming because there's natural variability in, in uh, normal weather. But we're loading the dice, as the scientists say. We're dramatically increasing the odds of large downpours coming all uh, in a short period of time. Lo thousands of my neighbors in Nashville lost their homes and did not have flood insurance. Why didn't they have flood insurance? Because they were assured when they bought their homes that they lived way outside the historic floodplain. So when the Army Corps of Engineers said this was a once in a thousand year rain, uh, they might have felt justified uh, in saying, well, if it only comes once every thousand years, maybe we don't have to worry about it. But all over the world, once in 500 year events, once in thousand year events are occurring more frequently. And they're having to change those tables because we have changed our relationship to the planet's ecosystem. We are now uh, beginning to see the, the uh, flow of refugees from some of the low-lying island nations. We're seeing the migration of tropical diseases to temperate latitudes. A and there are many other consequences. And yet we are still not doing much about it. Why is that? Well, one of my favorite quotes from uh, President Abraham Lincoln during his second address to the Congress, what we call the State of the Union uh, today, uh, was when he said, the occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves and then we will save our country. That got me to thinking about the word thrall. If you disenthrall yourself, that means you're getting out of thrall. I looked it up. Thrall, it, it comes from the Norse word for slave. And it was a form of voluntary slavery. And of course, it has come to mean, if you are in thrall with something, you, you are just uh, entranced by it. Uh, and being disenthralled means throwing off that trance. And it is easy for us as human beings to fall into habits and practices that just begin to feel automatic. And if there's risk involved, the thrall can blind us to the risk. One of the reasons the job market and the economy is so bad, as bad as it is right now, and again, thank goodness it's improving, is because a lot of people in the financial sector became enthralled with subprime mortgages. Now, I remember when uh, I signed my first mortgage, I got it from Walter Glenn Birdwell Jr. and Citizens Bank in Carthage, Tennessee. And y'all may not believe this, but I, my wife and I had to make something called a down payment. And, and, and we had to show evidence that we could make the monthly payments. I kind of missed the memo when they got rid of those requirements, but they were enthralled some years back with the idea of selling a lot more mortgages by selling them to people who had no earthly way to pay them back, much less make a down payment. And they were so enthralled, they said the risk can be ignored because we can group them all together and then we can put, securitize them and sell them into the global markets. Well, the old saying is there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. The most destructive thing in markets may be an assumption whose time has suddenly collapsed. So we became disenthralled with subprime mortgages when the global economy went into crisis. Now, the, we have been enthralled with oil and coal. And even after the uh, spill began in the Gulf, the head of the American Petroleum Institute said, uh, nothing has changed. We are still dependent on oil and gas. It reminded me of the day Elvis Presley died when his famous manager, Colonel Parker, got the news. He said, this changes nothing. And for the record, Elvis made $55 million last year posthumously. 
But it does change something, and it is time for us to disenthrall ourselves from this dependence on oil and coal and natural gas and recognize the transformation to renewable energy sources and much higher levels of efficiency, sustainable agriculture, sustainable forestry, sustainable architecture as the great challenge of our time. And your generation is going to be the generation that succeeds in completing this transition. I remember as a very young boy, 13 years old, when I heard a challenge issued to our country by President John F. Kennedy calling for us to put a person on the moon and bring him back safely in 10 years. And I remember how many people said that's impossible to do. We shouldn't have made, he shouldn't have made that pledge. But eight years and two months later, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the surface of the moon. And the day they did, a great cheering went up in Houston, Texas at Mission Control. And the average age of those systems engineers cheering in Houston was 26, which means their average age when they heard that challenge was 18. We're counting on you. You have a right to count on us. This university's motto, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it uh, in Latin, uh, veritatum cognoscetis et veritas te liberabit. What it means is, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It comes, uh, uh, of course, uh, from the book uh, of John. Uh, and the truth can be, indeed, inconvenient. But the single most important choice any of us make as individuals and as a society is between the hard right and the easy wrong. And just as this occasion offers an opportunity to make an assessment of how those who came before you have done, the day will come not too many years from now when a future generation will assess what you and uh, those of us who are still around have done over these next few years and decades. And if they look around them and see a world filled with chaos because the predictions of the scientists were allowed to come true, they would be justified in looking back and asking, what were you thinking? Didn't the truth set you free? But if they look around them and l see that they live in a world in the midst of economic renewal with millions of good new jobs being created in this transition to a sustainable economy and a sustainable society. If they feel hope in their hearts and don't just feel fine, but they feel optimistic and enthusiastic about the challenges ahead and feel that each new, next new generation's prospects will continue to improve, I want them to look back at this day and time and ask of us, how did you find the moral courage to rise up and solve a crisis that so many said was impossible to solve? We, I believe in my heart that we are going to solve this crisis. I believe that this is the greatest opportunity that our society has ever had. And I'm excited about the fact that from this day forward, you're going to be a part of all of the great work that our society is doing. I say congratulations to you uh, and, and thank you again for having me here. We've got everything we need to succeed with the possible exception of political will, but in the United States of America, political will is a renewable resource. Thank you and congratulations.